Welcome to Fan Counters. My name's Nick. And I'm Elizabeth. And this week on the show, we're going to go right back to our interview with Larry Heisel, professional Major League Baseball player uh, from the 60s and 70s. Before we do that, we're going to tell you that we're on Facebook. If you search Fan Counters, you'll find our big, strong group. All of our updates are posted there. Make sure you go, uh, there's a setting on there where you can see our posts first. So they'll always hit your newsfeed because thankfully, Facebook has this algorithm to decide what I would like to see and what I would not like to see. Yeah, I yeah, I, I see the weirdest things. <laughs> Somehow I must have clicked on something. I'm so over it. Very, like if I like wrong. something or I'm a friend of someone, I want to see their crap. Yeah. Like don't tell me. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, we're also on Twitter and Instagram at Fan Counters Live. You can follow us. Now, Elizabeth, have you been watching some of the new T V shows that are out there? No. Why? Or do you not have time for this? I don't. You oh. know, we dance three nights a week, and we never get home before 8 or 8.30, and the kids really need to be in bed at 7.30. So all we do when we get home from dance is get ready for bed and go to bed. Although I am anxiously awaiting um, the new Murphy Brown. Me too. And I did, um, I'm a little bit sad about the last season of The Big Bang Theory because that has been a, mm -hmm. a fan. I have a fan of that. Um, but other than that, I, you know, I see a couple of ads every once in a while for something that I'm like, oh, that looks okay. But, um, the Fox network is bringing back one of my all time favorite shows. Last man, man standing. standing. Gosh, I love that. So, um, that I'm really looking forward to that Me coming too. back. Mm -hmm. Um, I disagreed with them taking it off the air for his political views because he's had political views since he's started the right. show. And so I don't know why all of a sudden it was a big issue and pretty much same thing with Murphy Brown. You know, she has a very strong opinion and I just watched, uh, a little preview of it and uh, an interview with her about the fact that they haven't actually even finished writing the last three shows hmm. of the season because they're waiting to see what the political climate is and what's going on. Um, like come November. Right. Yeah. Before they before they put those last three in the can. Now, a couple weeks ago, we had uh, Deborah Williams, Tyra and her daughter, Hannah Stark on. Right. Yes. OK. And we talked about the fact that they were on that show, Mama June from Not, Not to Hot. Hot. Mm -hmm. I always want to say it the other way. Um, but anyway, there is a new show coming out. It's a Dancing with the Stars Juniors show. Oh, OK. Now, here's what's unfair about this show. They are bringing on all these celebrity kids to dance on the show. Okay. Alana Thompson, Honey Boo Boo, is one of them. Here's why the show is a little bit of a circus. Guess who one of the other dancers on the show is? You're like, I don't know any of these people. Uh, Mackenzie Ziegler from Dance Moms, one of the uh, top dancers on that show who's been on since she was like six years old, and now she's like 13. So seven seasons of Dance she's Moms. She's going to be one of the celebrity dancers yeah. or one of the professional dancers? No, one of the, the children contestants <laughs> oh. along with Alana Thompson. Huh. Now, if you saw the finale of the Mama June show where they're doing that talent in the pageant, <laughs> Alana doesn't have a chance. Okay. Like, it's a circus, folks. Dan dancing is not her strong suit. No. <laughs> Why is she on the show <laughs> against a professional child dancer? Well. Like, uh, the writing's on the wall, folks, but tune in. Dancing with the Stars Juniors comes to television this month. All right. Now it's time to get back into our interview. Uh, last week, we spoke with Larry Heisel former brewer, former Minnesota twin in Philadelphia, Philly. What a sweetheart of a guy. Just the heart of gold. Yeah. We're going to get um, answers to some of our questions like mine. What happens on the pitcher's mound during a conference? I know you're dying to ask him <laughs> that and about your super secret gold card. Right, right. So uh, let's get into that this week here on Fan Counters. Here's the rest of our interview with Larry Heisel. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is Fan Counters with Nick and Elizabeth on the Podfix Network. There was this mob of people, and they're screaming my name. Crazy fans. Stop following me. Don't come around my house. If you do the cops, I'm going to be at yours. If I'm having dinner with my wife, don't sit down at my table. Don't follow me into the bathroom. Can I take a picture? We're gonna, oh, my God. I think this guy wants to fight me. Ended up being a fan. I'm the only one that's ever been on Sam Jackson and lived to tell about it. Well, guess what? I have a big surprise for you. That's why we call it Fan Counters. <laughs> I don't think you're going to last on the air very long. Yeah. Well, you did finally get that World Series ring as the hitting coach for the Blue Jays. And you oh, actually have uh, two rings. 
As the batting coach, you preach patience and discipline. But how do you actually coach guys like Paul Molitor, who have a long history of success? You know, it, it was the greatest thrill. Um, in 93, the team accomplished something that has not been accomplished in 100 years. It was written about the top three hitters in the league were from the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, John Olerud, Paul Molitor, and Robbie Alomar. Mm -hmm. And it was a thrill. And, and one would ask, what do you tell Paul Molitor, who's, who's had a Hall of Fame career before he came there? You know, it was like what I told most players. Now, with young rookies, we had a whole different agenda. But with people like Paul, I told Paul, I'm going to memorize what you do when you're at your best. When I see a deviation from that, I'll come and let you know. <laughs> and, uh, and that was my job, to watch everything he did. And when he deviated from the norm, that's when I would come and tell him. And um, it was only just a couple of times. I, I do remember Paul coming to me. His average, average drop from probably about 332 to like 327. For most people, not a problem. But for Paul, Paul came to me and said, Larry, are you seeing anything different? And I said, Paul, nothing that I can see. But I said, are, are you mentally as strong as you were earlier in the year? And he said, no, Larry, I'm not. So we focused on that mental aspect of the game. But what a wonderful, wonderful approach. Paul Molitor is one of my favorite people on the entire planet. And when he became a Toronto Blue Jay, I was extremely pleased. As a matter of fact, I called the 93 World Series ring the Paul Molitor ring because had Paul not been a part of that team, I don't think we'd have won that World Series. It's certainly possible, but uh, with Paul, it, I, I knew we had a good chance of repeating that World Championship. Well, he was the MVP, and uh, one of the most prized possessions I own is a 1993 World Series baseball autographed by Paul Molitor. So. Oh, that might have been oh, one no, of the days. Wonderful. Yeah, it might have been one of the days that I cried though at the end of the '92 season when he left Milwaukee. Oh, uh, it was not easy to take for fans. Oh, and understandable. Uh, I was disappointed a little bit until I realized he was coming to me to Toronto. <laughs> and, uh, that made me happy. Uh... But you know, I'll never forget playing in Minnesota. I met Paul when he played for the. University of Minnesota, and when I went to spring training my first year, I had worked out with Paul. I gave Paul a call be, uh, before leaving Minnesota, and we worked out. And I'll never forget, after the last workout, I called Bud Selig and said, Bud, I'm not certain who the Brewers have battling for infield positions, but whoever it is, uh, they're going to have to compete with Paul Molitor. I said, the young man can play. And I'll never forget, the season started. We went to Minnesota, and his mother pulled me aside and said, Larry, would you do me a favor? And I said, you know, Mrs. Molitor, anything. She said, watch out for Paul. Please help him. And I said, oh, certainly, no problem. Mm -hmm. And I tell my friends, it was a week later that help was needed. But it wasn't for Paul. It was Paul had to help me. He was, <laughs> you know, I, I had never seen a player get come into the game with such a skill level and mastery of the game the way Paul has. He was just unreal. It seemed like once those batters finished one, two, three in the AL batting race, you pretty much could have written the contract with the Blue Jays for however long you wanted. Oh, oh, oh. But you oh. left them in 1995, essentially retiring from Major League Baseball. Uh, what made you decide to leave the game on a professional level? You know, I, I worked 
in the minor league system a, a year or two after that, I just felt that with, with my personality uh, and with my mindset, the younger players would probably be a better mix. And then when I did that and I loved that, I realized that maybe people in general would be a better mix for me with my type personality, my life experiences. So, you know, then I retired and uh, decided that I'm going to spend my time helping kids overcome the challenges that just permeated my life. And um, I can't think of anything that could bring me more joy than what I'm experiencing now. That plus my family um, uh, every day is for me is, is like Christmas. Returning back home to your wife and, and spending so much time with her, uh, how thrilled was she to finally say, welcome home. You don't have to travel every 10 days and be away for 10 days. And uh, what was that like for you to, to not have to travel and to actually be with your family all the time? 48 years ago, when my wife and I married, I remember talking to her about the life of a wife of professional athletes and the many challenges associated with it. And I said at the top of the list is being away from the family. I said, there'll be times when, when we have children that you'll not only have to be the mother, but you'll have to be the disciplinarian, uh, father, uh, everything. And it is a joy now to be home we have grandchildren who are our lives um, I thank my son and my daughter-in-law almost monthly for raising two children that bring me more joy than I ever could imagine Aww. are they close by they live less than a mile and a half from my wife and I my wife and I know my grandchildren wouldn't like this. Uh, <laughs> she still will pick them up from school and babysit them while our son and daughter-in-law works until they get off from work. But uh, uh, nice. they're, they're a joy for me. They both will call on the weekends and uh, they'll, they'll ask the same thing. And it's so funny. They use their terminology. They both will say, uh, they call me Gaga. <laughs> my granddaughter when she was young unable to say grandfather could only say gaga so that's my name they call me gaga and and, and they'll call or text on the weekends and use these these words they'll say gaga would you like to hang out <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> i tell my friends here's a 71 year old man hanging out with grandchildren and I love every second of it. I love every second of it. And how old are they? Grandson's 13 and granddaughter is 16. Just got her driver's license. Well, that's actually pretty rare because those teenagers want nothing to do with any adults. <laughs> so kudos to you being cool enough that they want to hang with you. <laughs> you know, I, I am just really shocked. When I work and they're off from school, they both love to go with me to schools. As a matter of fact, my granddaughter, she asked if when I go to schools to set it up where she, when she's not in school, could come there and mentor some of the girls at the schools. Nice. So I know the schools would love that. And my grandson as well, he'll go with me. Um, I love to take them with me to see to, to allow them to see the lives of other children and how their lives are being lived and what impacts their decision-making processes. So it's a privilege when they, when they go with me. Now, when we talked, Larry, you told me about something that I found quite fascinating. 
And <laughs> he's a little obsessed about it now. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you told me that players who play more than 10 years in the MLB get what's called a gold card that allows you to go to a ma- any major league game for free. Now, that's not what surprised me as much as you never use the card. <laughs> Are you kidding? So I have not. <laughs> so what's the deal and, there? And I, I've been to one game this year. I went to one last year. Uh, my schedule doesn't permit me to attend games. Um, I, I love. Now, what I do, I'll take the kids that I work with. Uh, to batting practice, to meet the players, let them sit in the dugout and take pictures. Nice. And oftentimes, uh, the kids from the inner city, they're not baseball fans, so I'll I'll take them back home. Um, So I don't get the privilege of staying for games, but that card gets me criticized so much. My best friend (laughs) uh, says that what I'm doing, not using that card, in his words, he said, is un-American. <laughs> he said, Larry, uh, I think that's how Nick Larry, feels, too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. And he's the biggest baseball fan. He would go to every game. Uh, he would travel around the country. But uh, maybe one day I'll use it. Maybe one day. All right. Well, if you're looking to pass it down to somebody, my hand is raised. Yeah. <laughs> Nick, is, <laughs> Nick is ready and willing to take that off your hands for you. <laughs> I don't know if Nick told you or not, but our listeners already know because we've spoken it before. Nick just recently had his 40th birthday, and you'll never guess where we all went. To a Brewer game. <laughs> oh, oh, wonderful. He, yeah, he got a suite wonderful. for us, and we all went to the Brewer game and watched and watched the game. And he's a little obsessive-compulsive about baseball. Just a little. Just oh. a little. <laughs> oh, oh, see, that, that's wonderful. That's, that's wonderful. I... Uh, like I said, I don't get the privilege to go. I attend a million sporting events from football where I have kids that will play football to a million basketball games. Um, I attend so many. I, I don't need it now because I'm so old. I get in the uh, free. But uh, <laughs> Milwaukee Public Schools would give me a pass that would entitle me to get in free to any sporting event but once you reach the age i think it's either 68 or 70 uh you get in free so i i don't need the card anymore but i attend a million sporting events and i love to watch young kids perform i think that athletics can teach some of life's greatest lessons so we've talked about your accomplishments on the field but i really want to talk and highlight your charitable efforts off the field You are known for charitable outreaches during your professional career, but even at age 71, you're actively involved in bringing baseball to underprivileged youth. Tell us a little bit more about the amazing opportunities that you're giving these kids here in Milwaukee. I'm truly embarrassed. Um, I I tell everyone that uh, what I do is, in my eyes, oftentimes selfish because of the joy that I receive blessed with the privilege of spending time with some of the most extraordinary people on the planet. I receive calls and I go visit children, uh, participate in activities that as long as I live will give me the fondest of memories about nine months ago, I lost a young boy that I worked with to cancer. Mm -hmm. And I'm so privileged. I I have so many wonderful relationships with young people, but no child liked me more than this young man. Once while visiting him in the hospital, one of my greatest compliments he gave me. Uh, He was 10 years old and the oncologist walked in the room with a new assistant. And he pointed to me and told uh, the young man whose name was Anthony. He said, Anthony, introduce your friend 
to my new assistant. Anthony looked over at me and said, that's my father. And uh, what made that the greatest compliment I ever received? Because Anthony went on to say why I, he felt I was his father. Uh, Anthony was white. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was just the greatest compliment. I had to do a lot of explaining to yeah. the oncologist's assistant. But, uh, you know, I, I went home and told my wife, and um, we just felt how privileged I am. But I, I go into the inner city. I go into homes to work with children, schools, hospitals, nonprofit organizations, detention centers. As a matter of fact, I got a letter. I'm supposed to be traveling to visit a young kid in the prison that I've worked with. And every child has had an amazing impact on my life. Um, when I am experiencing some of my most challenging events, I think about the children I work with and remind myself that I have to be strong going through this challenge so I can remind them how their challenge is and has inspired me. So, um, you know, this summer was a challenging summer for me. I was hospitalized, which I hadn't been hospitalized forever, and had some problems that kept me away from the kids. The kids would call, and, and I would tell them, don't worry, don't worry, I'm, I'm going to be fine. Mm -hmm. But I told them what I want you to remember, because I think about this every second when I'm challenged Every second I was in the hospital, I, I told the kids that all I could think of is how difficult this is and how happy I am because I know it's going to make me a better person when I overcome these challenges. And I tell every kid that that is the goal in life because no matter who we are, we're going to experience challenges adversity that oftentimes seems to the point that we can't bear. Mm -hmm. But with the right attitude and work ethic, we can overcome anything. And I have witnessed children overcome challenges and come out better on the other side. And every time I'm with a child, and it seems like the more challenging the situation, the more I focus on guaranteeing that they're going to come out better. It's a joy for me. And I can come home at night and lay in bed and think about child after child after child that have entered my life and made me a better person. And my goal is to try to repay all that's happened to me because of wonderful people in my life by going out and helping children to realize dreams that they thought were impossible to achieve. You sort of just answered my next question, uh, but I'm going to ask it in a different way because it's important to highlight that even at 71, you're, it's what you're doing is so selfless and awesome. Your phone will ring in the middle of the night, and on the other end... Oh. A judge might be on the other end, a cop, a social worker, uh, troubled kids during their worst moments of their life. How do you go about earning the trust of somebody who's already been told you're not going to amount to anything? How do you how do you turn that around? Nick, my primary goal, and, and you hit it on the head, is to win their trust. I focus on that more than anything. And Nick, uh, I, I come up with ways... Uh, and my wife criticized me, criticized me, but she's right. She said, Larry, you spend more time preparing to work with these kids than you did preparing to play sports. But it's the truth. Uh, I went to a class uh, last week, 
and Nick, what I did, it, it was first time going to class, and I have to win them over. I have to win their trust. So, Nick, what I did, I got some of my baseball cards and went to a trading shop and got some other cards of African Americans, covered up the name, walked into the class, talked to the class, and said, I'm going to give you a test, the most challenging test you'll ever take in your life. Hmm. I said, when you're in Harvard and you're attending Yale and you're taking calculus, analytic geometry, physics, won't come nearly as difficult as this test I'm going to give you. <laughs> so what I be did, worried now. Yeah, I brought out some cards, my baseball cards, held them up and said, which one of these cards are me? <laughs> and they would look at the cards and try to pick them out. And we would laugh. But like with those children, as well as the kids I w work with, I have to win their trust. Nick, to a degree that I, and I tell my friends that when they're making those important life decisions, whether to do something or participate in an activity or not, I want them to say, if I make the wrong decision, I I'm going to hurt Mr. Heisel. Ah. And, and, and it's my hope that maybe working with them to a degree where they think so much of me that it'll make them rethink making a bad decision. And, and my ultimate goal is, is to have them like me as much. I try to get them even more than they do their parents so that when those decisions come about, they'll think a little bit about me and how much it would hurt me if they make that wrong decision. You're in the back of their head now. You're you're a little piece of their conscience. Oh, that's my goal. Because <laughs> Nick, I have to be honest. When when I was living my life, in the back of my mind all the time was my mother. Um, and Nick, to this day, she inspires me to do well. When I played ball, I'd be practicing, and I'd say, "Boy, I'm a little tired. I'm about ready to quit." And then I ask myself, gee, would my mother quit? Uh -huh. And I tell myself she wouldn't, so I'd stay there a little longer. So that impact that my mother had on me, I'm hoping that I can have on children as well that I work with. So Bud Seeley once said that, and I quote, you are one of the nicest human beings he has ever met in his entire life. Oh. It, <laughs> Isn't that nice? <laughs> oh, my. Uh, gee, I, you know, statements like that embarrasses me. I, <laughs> I I do have to admit, though, I try to live the best life imaginable. Um, and in doing so, if, if I'm lucky enough that people think that way of me, I'm, I'm privileged. But I just try to do what. I've been taught and I know would make my mother proud. Are there former players that you know of that maybe you connect with in other cities, other teams that are doing what you do? To a degree, there are some players uh, that I know that will uh, have baseball camps for kids, um, but I don't know any that will take it to the degree that I do. Um, when, when I work with the kid, and I tell them all, uh, I said, I'll tell them, you know, there's going to be good and bad with our relationship. I said, there's one thing that when I work with kids, it, it's going to be bad. And that is, I've never learned how to do anything halfway. So I said that for the rest of your life, I'm going to be involved. Uh, Ten years from the day, I'm going to be calling. When you do good, I'll be the happiest man alive. I'll be the first to congratulate you. When you make a mistake, I'll be that one who's going to let you know that that can't happen again. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm going to be in your life in ways that you never thought humanly possible. Let's uh, talk a little bit about your son. 
So it must feel good to have your son, Larry Heisel Jr., following your footsteps. <laughs> he is also an amazing athlete, but he's now doing great things in the community. Talk about his organization, Directors of Continuing Services. You know, my son, and I am as proud of him as any father could be, um, growing up never caused my wife and I any problems. Um, I don't remember getting angry with him at all. Um, he was just a, a great son and I think even a greater father. Matter of fact, uh, my little grandson, um, I don't help out at all when it comes to his baseball. Uh, he's 13, and I think it happened when he was about seven. We were practicing, just he and I, uh, with hitting. And I remember telling him about doing something a little differently than the way he was doing it. And he answered in the way, let me know where he gets his information. He <laughs> said, Dad told me that this is how it's supposed to be done. And I learned that. I said, you're right. I said, uh, we do what Dad says. So honestly, if I told him one thing and his father said the complete opposite, he would do what his father said, which, which makes me proud. And my son really, really loves the game, so he studies a great deal. But my son is giving back as well uh, in, in ways that I never thought humanly possible. He loves young people, enamored with helping kids athletically, but also educationally and in their challenges as well. I would say he gets that from you. Oh, you're much too kind. I don't <laughs> know. I, I, But I just sit back and marvel at you know, the way he teaches and the way he instructs and the way the kid kids will listen. It's a privilege. Um, and I know my, if my wife were beside me and talking, she would say that he's made the two of us the proudest parents on the planet. Aww. Now, Larry, you've been very generous with your time today, giving us uh, much longer than I thought. And I really do want to thank you for that. Um, to finish today, I've got some pressing baseball questions that being a former major league player, I would love to get your opinion on. So, okay. These are hard ones to start. Will Barry Bonds ever get inducted into the, the baseball hall of fame? Wow. That first one. Was... <laughs> <laughs> right oh, out of the goodness. back there. Yes. Wow. That is an interesting question. I think about that a lot. Um, at times, I will say he will, and other times, I'll say that he won't. I think clearly, you know, one day, if I had to come up with an answer, I would say he will one day. But there will always be an asterisk by his name that will say that he performed the game differently than the majority of players. Um, I watched that young man when he first began, and he would have been an outstanding player no matter what took place in his life. Uh, I think he would have been the Hall of Fame uh, being uh, the player that he began and people knew early in his career. I agree. Uh, he chose, you know, maybe to try things a little differently. Uh, what he's accomplished, my goodness, I, I think uh, will be remembered forever. But I do also believe that when they do talk about his name, that they will, there'll be a little asterisk and there'll be reasons why they felt he achieved what he did. Um. I just am curious, as a side note to that, in your era of baseball, were there guys using things that were questionable back then? Um, no, I don't remember any player 
ever when I played uh, using uh, steroids. Now, Nick, I do have to admit, though, near the end of my career, when, when I wasn't traveling a lot, um, hard drugs made its way in the sports, mm-hmm. the heroin and the cocaine, and, and there were a number of players that were caught using that. Um, and, and hopefully that uh, was addressed and uh, not a part of what they believe enhances their chance of enjoying life. Nick, which brings up an excellent point. When I, when I work with kids, you know, they'll ask, Mr. Heisel, is there anything that you know I can do that will make me a better athlete? Anything I can take? Uh-huh. And, 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 you know, I, and, and I have to be honest with kids. And I tell them, what's going to make you the best is just hard work and effort. Nick, when I work with kids, I, I tell them, because it was a philosophy that I lived by. I remember when I was 13, I told myself things that I wanted to achieve, but more importantly, specific things that I couldn't participate in. I couldn't do. And Nick, when I was 13, I'll never forget telling myself, I can't smoke, drink, or use drugs as long as I'm an athlete. And I tell the kids, I'm 71. Uh, I've never smoked a cigarette. Uh, I I wouldn't know what beer tastes like. Hmm. And I've never experimented with a drug. And I tell them all, there's not a happier man on this planet. And what I want to convince young athletes, don't believe the hype that you can take something that's going to make you a better athlete. Maybe... The great athletes are taking things uh, now, but I guarantee you it didn't make them who they are. Greatness is the product of hard work and effort. You were the very first designated hitter. Should the DH come to the National League or should the AL get rid of it? Another wonderful question. I'm old school Being a DH helped my career some when I was injured. But if I could determine the fate of baseball, I would eliminate it. Um, And I know from a fan standpoint, scoring runs are important. But I just think that every player should participate fully in the game. Mm -hmm. And even though as a pitcher, you may not be the best hitter, Still, there are obligations that practice is important to achieve and things. Learning to bunt, uh, move that runner would be so important. And, and I think it's just the valuable part of the game that makes strategies so, so, so important. Um, uh, when I played it, and certainly strategies are, are, are important now, but uh, knowing that that pitcher would come up uh, in two innings and possibly they may have to take him out for a pinch hitter. Uh, the thought process might change a little bit. Um, you get uh, a runner on on second base and um, or, or first base and uh, there's uh, an out uh, do you pitch to that number eight hitter uh, or, or do you walk him, try to get that pitcher out and then face that first batter in the order? Um, th- there's just a ton of strategies that I like that involve that pitcher being a part of the game that I just haven't been able to get out of my system. But, you know, most of my friends, though, they love the home run. They love the <laughs> double. They love having nine players hit. So I don't think it'll change. I do agree. The only with way you. it would change would be if I become the president of, of baseball <laughs> or the commissioner, and that'll never happen. Oh. So I'm quite sure the DH is safe. Well, I, I like the fact of 
thinking about getting rid of it. I'm with you. I, I think that all this, there's way more strategy involved when the pitcher is part of your lineup. All right, Larry, just uh, three more real quick. Uh, have analytics ruined the game? Oh, wow. It, it certainly made people think a lot. Um, I remember when they started to use a, a, a lot of the numbers, and, and, and I'll never forget, I, I read an article where they said that um, the sacrifice bunt is obsolete, never should be used. Because they determined that uh, you get that run to the second base, uh, there were hits, more hits than uh, possibly you could get more hits than sacrificing. Right. You're wasting a bat. But I always tell my friends, I said, that information is available during a different era of the game. I said, if you're facing a Bob Gibson or a Sandy Koufax and you have a runner on second base, you will not get two consecutive hits against those men or two hits in one inning. So you're going to have to bunt in the second base, hoping that you can get one hit to scoring. Uh, but with the advent and, and the onslaught of all the home runs and extra base hits, uh, I could see why they could say, the sacrifice bunt should not be used. But it's my thinking, you get a great pitcher out there, like a Hayter or a Jefferson, uh, you get a man on first base, you know, you're not going to get two hits off of them in one inning. So I think it would be imperative to to get that runner the second. And also I've read, you know, they talk about uh, on base percentage now and the importance of that. To me, it's always been important, even when I played, uh, my goodness, when I first began, players with that ability to get on base, and we didn't have all the uh, algorithms and uh, computer technology available today, but we knew which players didn't strike out a great deal, got walks, move runners, uh, so that was a, a big part of the game. I think it, it could be important, but to, to give you an example where it could be challenged, uh, for example, if the Brewers are, are playing, it's late in the game. Um, you have a pitcher pitching that has faced the hitter um, last couple of years and has been outstanding against the hitter. Maybe 28 at-bats, the hitter's gotten only two at-bats. Um, the hitter comes up in a crucial situation. Now, you might say, okay, I, I'm not going to let him hit. Mm -hmm. But what happens under that same situation? And uh, the hitter's hitting like Yellick. You know, would, would you take him out? Even though in the past, the pitchers have a great, great, time against Yellick. Uh, I think there you, you would question statistics. So I think there are some situations where you can question statistics, but I, I think there is an importance there that will be used probably forever. A couple of years ago, Fox did an MLB TV series about the first woman pitcher in the major, major leagues. Will women eventually get to play in the major leagues? I hope so. I am the biggest, biggest supporter of women's rights on the planet. Um, and certainly, I think if they had the ability, they should be given that opportunity. But so here in this country, you know, boys from the day they're born, they play baseball day in and day out. And girls don't have that same thought process about the game uh, so they don't put in as much time. But I'm quite sure there'll be a time when there's a young lady that comes up and likes the game as much as boys, plays as much as boys, and will be given that chance. So I think one day it might happen. This is a big one. This is my personal uh, question. I've always wanted to ask a major league player. I know you were an outfielder, but I got to okay. know. What was actually said 
during conferences on the mound? Are they always all about the game? <laughs> <laughs> or are you all talking about pizza after the game? <laughs> <laughs> this is serious stuff. And, and Nick, and that's a, a very good question. The majority of the time, it's baseball. But <laughs> you know, oftentimes a manager will come and out will come out to a pitcher. Pitcher's been really pressing, and he'll just try to lighten things up. And he might talk about a subject having nothing to do with baseball. But most of the time, I do have to admit, it is baseball related. Which Nick, I was telling the young kid that I had in the dugout. I said, "This is." for me personally, the best place on the planet to be. I said, during the game, information is being shared. Player from player. I told him when I first began, I let off. And my most important job was to come back and give information about the pitcher. Uh And even though a pitcher has been a veteran pitcher, been pitching for six, seven years, uh, Fastball could be a little harder, have a little more movement on it. So there's just a plethora of information being exchanged. And I love that more than anything. Uh, Everybody is trying to find out ways to help win games. And that's the part of the game I love the most and miss the most. That's very cool. See, little things I didn't even know. See, I I thought y'all were ordering pizza. No. (laughs) (laughs) So after this game, let's go to. (laughs) Well, my favorite one is the guy goes out there and he's like, "Uh, okay, throw strikes. Okay, coach, got it. (laughs) You know, it's like, what could they possibly be saying? (laughs) I'm right on that. (laughs) Well, Larry Heisel, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Uh, We really do appreciate all you do for our community. Thank you. For the kids. Uh, for everything, you're you're way too humble for all that you do. And on behalf of everybody you've you've touched personally by your uh, just being there for them, thank you. Oh, believe me, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, you bet. We appreciate it. Our thanks to Larry Heisel for giving us two weeks of material, uh, tons of stories. What an all-around great guy! Oh. I am so thankful that I got to hear his story and see. And, and really highlight what a great person he is. Yeah, he is quite remarkable. It's a, uh, it's a tough road to be an African American in the in the seventies and the eighties. And but even know, today in the inner city, the, it, the, yes. the way he is helping build up a community that feels like they have no hope, right, is awesome. So, yeah. Larry, thank you for all you do. Kudos to you. Yeah. You can follow us on social media by going to at Fan Counters Live on Twitter and Instagram. Our Facebook group is where most of our updates occur, and you can do that at facebook.com forward slash Fan Counters. We're always looking for your show suggestions, and you can email those to us at hello at fancounters.com. That'll do it for this week. Make sure you tune in next week for another guest. We're going to go away from baseball. We've done baseball three weeks now. We are returning with a friend of yours. We are, yes, a high school classmate of mine. Yeah, she, guys, Elizabeth held out on me. And I'm going to tell you all about that next week, but she knows a celebrity, and they're going to be here next week on Fan Counters. See ya. This was a podcast from the Pod Fix Network. You can check out more shows like it at podfixnetwork.com.